Some people see a challenge as the end of their dreams, or at least despise it as an unnecessary impediment. Others see a challenge as the beginning of a good story. Hi, I'm Rabbi Yisrael Bernath, and welcome to my Daily Jewish Thought, a special for the week of Parshat Vayetze. Here's a story that I recently heard from Simcha Jakobovich, who's a filmmaker in Toronto. He says, the phone rang in my New York hotel room. It was 1995, and I was saying Kaddish for my late father of blessed memory, Joseph Jakobovich. I live in Toronto, but I'm a filmmaker, so I move around. During my 11 months of saying Kaddish, I ended up in various minyans from San Francisco to Halifax. Once, I extended a stopover in Detroit and rushed to the basement of an old synagogue where I was greeted by nine minyaners as if I were the Messiah himself. But the phone call in New York was the start of what turned out to be perhaps the most interesting Kaddish experience of them all. I had just finished a documentary called The Selling of Innocence. The film won an Emmy, attracting the attention of Oprah. The American icon and celebrated TV host. The producer at the end of the telephone asked if I could fly to Chicago and appear with my fellow producers on the Oprah show the day after next. I was taken aback. This was the Oprah show. This was the 90s. The big time. Great publicity for the film and a great promotional opportunity for me and my company. I'd love to do it, I said, but I don't think I can. Why not, the producer asked, her voice betraying her surprise. Nobody says, too busy to the Oprah show. I have a problem, I answered. The producer's voice, Lisa was her name, became steely. All business. What's the problem, she asked. It's complicated. Try me. I began the process of explaining to a non-Jewish television producer from Chicago the Jewish ritual of Kaddish. Whenever I had, I had to explain this, people would never quite get it. I would tell them I needed a minion, and they would drive me to an empty synagogue. It quite never worked out. But this was Oprah, so I gave it a try. I'm Jewish, my father passed away, in our religion it's incumbent upon me three times a day to say a certain prayer, a glorification of God's name. Really, it's called the Mourner's Kaddish. To do this, I need to be in a Jewish quorum. It's called a minion, so I can't miss the ritual. If I come to Chicago, I'd have to attend morning services prior to being on Oprah. No problem, she said. You need a minion to say Kaddish? Ten Jewish men for morning services? I'll arrange it. It's not so simple. I mean, you may find a synagogue, but it may not have a minion in the morning. Or the Jewish community may send you to a synagogue that's not open, which wouldn't do the trick for me. Lisa tried to be patient. I'll fax your flight information to your hotel. You'll be met in Chicago by a limo. The driver will have the minion information. You'll say Kaddish for your father. And the rest unfolded like military operation, he says. The next day, the ticket came. I arrived in Chicago. Then the limo came. The driver took me to a hotel and said, I'll be there at 6.30 a.m. for your minion. Your minion begins at 7 a.m. I'll pick you up at 8 a.m. You'll be at the Oprah show by 8.30. The hotel room was beautiful. I slept like a baby, and at 6.30 in the morning, I came down, stepped into my limo, and there was a newspaper on the seat. I could get used to this, I thought. The driver pulled up in front of a downtown office building and told me that there was a Chabad minion on one of the upper floors. When I got there, the rabbi looked at me and said, Oh, So you're the guy saying Kaddish. I was warned by the Oprah show that I had better have a minion. We smiled at each other. I was really impressed with Lisa and Oprah. And I felt that my father was surely amused. After prayers, my driver took me to the Oprah show. I was met by Lisa, a black woman in her 30s. She got straight to the point. You had a minion? Yes. (laughs) Thank you, I said. Was it proper? Did you say Kaddish? Absolutely. uh, Couldn't be better, I answered. She looked at me with that look that star surgeons have when they come out of the operating room. Or maybe it's the look of the battle commanders have when coming back from a military operation. It's the look that says, nothing is too complicated. I was on Oprah. She was very professional, and I have my five minutes of fame. But all I can remember of that day is the Kaddish. How many Kaddishes do we say every year? 
depending on this custom, anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000. The truth is that this year, it's so difficult for people saying Kaddish because of the pandemic. So even though often we say so many Kaddishes, this year it's been few and far between, unfortunately, for many. But how many of them did Simcha blog about? How many of them make a good story? Only one. The one he thought couldn't happen. The one that was the hardest to pull off. I think that it's important to think about this today. That every story needs a challenge. To grow. To succeed. To write your own story. You have to go out of your comfort zone. And this is exactly the story of this week's Torah portion, Vayetze. Which means, and he went out. Jacob had to flee from his home, his land, and run to live with an uncle who was a crook. On the surface, you could say he had to run because his brother wanted to kill him. Or we can say that he had to run in order to grow, to be part of a great story. But the Torah gives us both options. It tells us he went because his brother wanted to kill him. But it also tells us that he went to get married to start a family. We can look at any of our challenges with either of those two lenses. We can opt to view ourselves as victims of circumstance, running away from our dreams because others are ruining them for us. Or we can see ourselves as master storytellers, running towards our goals on the tail of a challenge. Jacob would have loved to stay within the Jewish walls of his parents' home within the holy energy of the Holy Land. But he had to leave. Did he give up? Was this the end of his Judaism? Was this the end of Jewish continuity? Not at all. While not in Israel, while outside of the quote-unquote shtetl, outside of his element, he didn't become less Jewish. On the contrary, he built the first eternal Jewish family. His father Isaac and grandfather Abraham each had Jewish children, but not a whole family. Jacob had a whole family, and a large one, 13 children. And his family's Jewishness wasn't a fleeting fad. 4,000 years later, I could show you members of his family. Jews, us, known as the children of Israel, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel, Israel is Jacob's second name. We are his great-grandchildren. Could it be difficult to live Jewishly today? Could it be challenging to keep kosher? Challenging to celebrate Shabbat? Maybe challenging to date Jewish? Of course. But what kind of story would it be without a challenge? The challenges of living Jewish don't have to end your dreams. To the contrary. They could be the beginning of a great story. So today, I ask you, what's your story? And if the story didn't happen yet, which story like Simcha, which story of a Kaddish on the Oprah show are you going to write? And what's going to be your Jewish story? Learn from Jacob, learn from Simcha, and I'm eager to find out what your story will be. I'm Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. Have a great day. Hi there. I just wanted to let you know that I just launched a brand new website. It's theloverabbi.com, T-H-E-L-O-V-E-R-A-B-B-I.com, theloverabbi.com. And it has um, lots of very interesting uh, things there, especially you can purchase um, a lot of the different classes and uh, lectures that I have given um, over the past few years. And you can also take a look at the current classes and lectures that I'm giving, and the current events that I am doing on relationships. So I encourage you to go check it out. It's theloverabbi.com. Thanks so much.